Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast. I'm your host Jack Perks and this week I'm interviewing Steve Simpson. Now we're going to be talking about how fish can talk to each other. Yeah that's right fish have excellent hearing and they can also talk in various means and we're going to be exploring that with Steve Simpson. But first we're going to cover the news. And I'm not sure if you've noticed but we are in the middle of a pandemic. Maybe we're not in the middle, maybe we're just at the beginning. It could go on for fuck knows how long. But uh, recently, bat experts have launched a campaign, Don't Blame Bats, to dispel unfounded fears and myths around bats which are threatening their conservation. Now, the precise origin of the virus that has wreaked such havoc across the world has not been pinned down, but the vast majority of science agree that it's crossed into humans from an animal species, most likely a bat. Now, that doesn't mean that bats are to blame. It's our increasing interference with these wild creatures that's at the root of the problem. Scientists estimate that three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases in people come from animals. A warning of the dangers that came in 2002 when the mysterious illness SARS emerged in China, killing almost 800 people around the world. Now, Dr. David Robertson of the University of Glasgow says it'd be a terrible outcome if bats were demonised, since the spread of diseases from animals to human is much more about humans encroaching into their domain rather than the other way around. Bats are, of course, an integral part of the ecosystem, pollinating many flowers and controlling biting and annoying insects. So we can't do without bats, really. It's more a case of don't bung them up in food markets and we'll get along just fine. Now, my guest this week is Professor Steve Simpson of the University of Exeter in their Biosciences Department. He's done work all over the world, but particularly in a marine environment, looking at fish and how they communicate, something we don't associate very often with fish. Uh, Noise is recorded incredibly well in birds, in vertebrates, in mammals, but we don't think of fish being that noisy. And in actual fact, many fish produce many incredible noises, which Steve does a great impersonation of, I should just add. So here's our chat. Well, thanks for joining me, Steve. Hi there. Yeah, real pleasure to be with you today, Tech. No worries. Well, you specialise in an area that I know very little about, which is fish communication. And it might surprise people to learn that fish have excellent hearing. But not only that, they talk to each other, don't they, In in a manner of speaking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it, you know, it still blows my tiny mind as well. The more we think about the the, the acoustic ecology of fish, the more we learn. Um, and communication is a really important part of that of that acoustic ecology. Yeah. So why are they why are they making noise then? What's the reason for fish fish to talk? <laughs> yeah. Well, so so I guess um, vocal behaviour and hearing in fish um, evolved probably very early on in the evolution of fishes. And that's because the ocean and the freshwater environments carry acoustic signals, carry acoustic information, acoustic cues really well. Water is much better than air for uh, sound to travel through. It's a very dense medium, so sound travels really well. Um, And obviously, if you're a fish um, and you're living in the water, your vision is really only going to get you uh, 20 meters on a really clear coral reef. Whereas sound is something that allows um, animals to communicate underwater over tens, hundreds, thousands of meters. So we think certainly some fish can hear over a kilometer um, uh, away from where they are. Whales, we know, can, you can communicate across whole ocean basins. Yeah, they're quite so well probably, documented, aren't they, cetaceans? We know a lot about them yeah. making noise, but fish maybe not so much. That's, that's right, yeah. So probably, I, I guess it was kind of those classic records of the 90, in the 1960s of, of Humpback Whale Song that brought marine acoustics to the human, um, um, you know, to the human um, perception in the first place. Jacques Cousteau, the, the decade before, in the 1950s, had made Le Monde de Silence, the silent world. And the oceans were assumed to be this beautiful, serene, silent environment. But if you go snorkeling on a reef or, um, you know, even on some habitats in the UK, you'll be amazed by how much you can hear. And some of that sound is being deliberately produced by animals to communicate. Other other sounds are more incidental, things like urchins scraping away on the rocks or parrotfish chomping at the coral. But there's a lot of sound that animals are making deliberately because they want to communicate with each other. So how are these fish, uh, I know each fish will be slightly different, but how are they actually making these noises then? 
Yeah, good question. And, and we probably <laughs> don't know all the answers to that. We, every time we dip our hydrophone, we hear new fish sounds that we've no idea which species is making it. <laughs> there's, a, there's generally a few different ways that fish can make sounds. One of them is just simply through grinding the pharyngeal teeth, the teeth in the back of the jaws. So that creates like a scraping sound. There is uh, the jaw snapping shut, so a popping sound. Um, I saw a video last week of some salmon actually, which are thought to be not very vocal, but a, sa a male salmon using a snapping sound from its jaw. I think I saw that um, as well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, clownfish take it to the next level with uh, a kind of special structure of bones that can get um, kind of compressed under tension and then they release and create a really loud snap type, type sound. And they can actually do that quite quickly to create like a bub 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 sort of sound. So that's that one's definitely purposeful then. That's not like a you can't you couldn't argue that's by accident. They are doing that. You, you know, you can't with fake that for no. sure. Absolutely. Um, there's then an amazing, you know, within the damselfish family as well as the clownfish that create these kind of popping. The sergeant major fish, which tend to defend colonies of uh, or kind of nests of eggs on the sides of uh, reef slopes, create croaking sounds, sort of chirping sounds. Um, and then just very recently, we've discovered that there's a sound we've been hearing in recordings everywhere from Taiwan to Australia that turns out to be another damselfish. It's the Ambon damselfish, which makes a whooping sound. So, so we think that's probably linked to the swim bladder, but it's a kind of whoop, 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 almost like a, um, like a pigeon sort of sound, a cooing sound. It's celebrating. That's a really interesting sound because it's about 700 hertz or so, which is higher than a lot of the fish sounds. And it's quite a quiet window in the reef soundscape. So it gives them this private communication channel. Um, and then I guess the famous sounds that were first documented were things like cod and haddock that have, I don't know if, if, ever, you, if, you, if ever you buy a cod or a haddock from the fishmongers and it's not been gutted, if you, if you, if you move, uh, remove the guts, you'll find the swim bladder and the swim bladder lies underneath the spine and is this really thickly musk, muscle, um, a kind of muscle coated balloon that the haddock or cod uses to control its buoyancy. And the muscles are in rings so they can, they can basically cause that swim bladder to resonate and it becomes a really, a really loud vocal instrument that the cod and haddock use, particularly the male cod. Um, they hang around in spawning aggregations around spawning time. Males will side up to a female, and if she likes the look of him, they'll swim towards the surface. As they swim up, he's got about six seconds to get this perfect love song out <laughs> before she either chooses to swim back down because he's no good, or she chooses to release her gazillions of eggs. So, um, and, it's, and it's through resonating the swim bladder that they can create these deep thumping and, and uh, knocking sounds. We've all so, been yeah, there. <laughs> a whole range of different sounds. Um, I mentioned that when we put a hydrophone in the water, there's some sounds we don't know what we're hearing. We were doing some filming for Blue Planet Live last year with um, um, out on uh, Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef. And we dropped a hydrophone off the dockside um, at dawn. And then when we filtered the recording just down to the low frequencies, there was a pub laugh fish. The only way you can describe it is that it's got a pub laugh. So when you listen to it, it kind of goes, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that laugh that you'd hear across the pub. Um, and, uh, and who knows what species it is? There's so much to discover. <laughs> That's a great mystery, isn't it? The fish that's get, going to a pub and laughing underwater. You, <laughs> yeah. You've got to find that one out. Exactly. So you mentioned about the hydrophone. So how are you, how are you recording the sound of fish underwater? Because that's quite a, an unusual thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess luckily for us, from about the late 1990s, um, Navy equipment became more available to biologists. And so the Navy had been listening to the ocean for decades, listening out for submarines, listening out for uh, torpedoes, for ships in the distance, for um, deep sea um, testing of warheads, things like that. Um, but the hydrophones became available really in the late 90s for us to be able to start to buy and to listen to the ocean from the perspective of a biologist. Um, the simple hydrophone is just a length of cable with a hydrophone that's about probably the size of a plum 
something like that sort of size on the end of it. Um, it's got piezoelectric crystals inside that when sound pressure um, hits the crystals, the crystals get compressed and create an electric voltage, which then uh, with an amplifier, you can turn into a recording of the sound. Um, so, so that's the simple system. Um, we've now started building multi-hydrophone arrays that can hear in different directions at the same time. So they've got some directionality to the, um, to the hydrophone in the same way that a bird researcher would use a directional microphone to listen to a bird in the forest in the distance. We're starting to be able to do that underwater, which means we can then put the array around a group of fish and we can start to identify which fish is making which sound and to start to interpret their communication their, you know learn their language yeah so obviously it's going to help you if you if you know which fish is making which noise we had a, a sound recordist on for for wildlife last week and yeah he was mentioning mm -hmm. that you know underwater is uncharted almost it's not uh not nearly as well documented as, as topside is it so it's, yeah. it's hugely exciting every day you get to you know whether it's in freshwater environments um in lakes in ponds in the rivers in um you know in the deep ocean um on coral reefs anywhere you go the arctic the antarctic anywhere you put a hydrophone you're going to make a new discovery um yeah, yeah it's, it's really exciting so are you finding uh, that like birds in cities they they kind of make a louder call don't they in urban scapes do you find that fish say living in harbours, are they having to walk their game or is it just something we don't know yet? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, we do know, that's called the Lombard effect, which is where in noisy environments, uh, animals, including humans, produce uh, more noise. It's why you have to shout if you go to a, a nightclub or a cocktail <laughs> party. Um, so that's one way that fish may, may be able to make themselves heard. Um, we've got a PhD student at the moment, Isla Davidson, who's looking at multimodal communication. Um, and so she's really interested in, in a noisy environment, whether fish, if they're vocalizing, reinforce that vocal um, um, uh, mode of communication with perhaps something physical at the same time. So it could be a, a strange swimming pattern at the same time as vocalizing, which then mean that it's really obvious who's making the sound. Um, but there are other things that birds do and other animals in noisy environments to get themselves heard. So one of them is that they can change the time of when they're producing sound. Um, so really good examples um, you find, say, around busy roads where you've got rush hour and animals choose not to bother communicating. And then you go into the quiet periods or on the weekend and you get more vocal behaviour. Um, you can change your frequency to some extent. We're not sure how much fish really have control over the frequencies that they can produce. Um, but if there's a lot of frequency sound at 400 hertz and you're producing sound at 400 hertz, then you're going to be masked by that other noise. Um, if you can move to 600 hertz, then your sound starts to stand out a bit more. And we certainly know that um, gobies in streams in Italy um, can do that. It's called calling in the gap, where the, they, they tailor their vocal behaviour around the background ambient sounds to get the, the quiet spaces in that soundscape. So yeah, guess, there's a range of things. I guess is that because they're in fast flowing water, they have to change it because I guess the closer they are to the water, it'd be louder, the further away. So they're, that's something they would naturally do, I guess. Yeah, that's right. And I think as water's flowing in streams as well, it depends on the speed it's flowing and what the substrate is and so on as to what the frequencies are likely to be. So they can then try and find the right frequencies around those and um, to get some quiet calling, to get their own kind of private line. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've all been there when you're holding your mobile up and you, you can't get through to someone. <laughs> so you have to feel for these Italian, Italian yeah. gobies. Yeah. You, you mentioned... Uh, you know, predominantly this coral reefs where you've been studying, and you mentioned the cod and the haddock. Has there been any other studies on British fish, whether they communicate? I mean, anecdotally, I know anglers say things like gudgeon and bullheads will gurgle a little bit. Whether that, I mean, that, that might just be air escaping, but I don't know if there's been any studies closer to home. Yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly um, bullheads and things will croak when you catch them. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of fish have got their names around the world because of the sounds they make when they're caught. Grunts, croakers. Yeah. Um, and so on. And so, so certainly some UK fish can produce sound in that, in that sense. Um, the, the likelihood is that some of the more reef dwelling fish, things like 
uh, RAS might use sound where they've got a territorial and quite hierarchical social structure. Um, gobies and blennies certainly can produce sound and can hear sound quite well. Um, the gadoids probably all can, so the cod and haddock are the classic ones, but probably whiting and um, you know, pouting and all sorts of other things would be able to um, join in that chorus. Um, I guess one of the most unusual sounds which, um, which made it actually won an Ig Nobel Award for its classic discovery um, was the herring. Now herring can't produce sound vocally, but they've got a special trick to maintain their school at night. They'll swim up to the surface as it starts to get dark and start gulping air, which they swallow down into their belly. Um, and then through the night, particularly if they get, find themselves isolated, or if they realize that there are predators around, they can start gradually releasing that air through their anus, which, uh, which it brilliantly is termed a fast repetitive tick. Which, which you can imagine what the acronym might be from a, a, an, an FRT. Yeah. Um, and so they can create this kind of squeaking noise sort of sound. <laughs> and that is a really important way that they can actually stick together and, and avoid predation at night. See, if, so, I, yeah. if I made so, that noise, I would be quite worried uh, if, that, <laughs> if that was coming out of me. I wouldn't. I that's wouldn't be right, <laughs> exactly. So, so there's no limit to the creativity of fish to produce sound. I think I have heard that before, farting heron. So that is, yeah, that's an incredible mm. adaptation. Like, how did evolution arrive mm. at that, thinking, you know what, <laughs> that's the best way? That's right. You'd normally think that if you can't control your flatulence, that <laughs> you'd soon get weeded out of the gene ball. But it turns out it's a, a brilliant defensive strategy. It, it's a strength. That, that, there you go. You know, <laughs> farting will help you survive against predators. So there, there you go. Um, when, when watching Blue Planet 2, you talk about these man-made sounds forming an acoustic fog. I love that, that word, mm. acoustic fog, uh, blocking many creatures from hearing. So, so how is that a problem for them? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really a, a lot of our research started in natural soundscapes, animal communication, importance of natural soundscapes. And, and for a long time, we occasionally would just have anthropogenic noise, as we call it, noise pollution, being a bit of a problem to our science. You know, we would, in fact, you can just hear someone dragging a trolley outside. You know, occasionally, we'd be trying to take a perfect recording and, and a noise like that would occur. You know, maybe the, there'd be a ship on the horizon or there would be one of our research team coming over in a boat to join us. And we'd have to stop taking the recording, wait for the noise to finish and then start again. And, and over the years, it became more obvious that that sound was actually a real nuisance to marine animals, including fish. Um, now, at the very least, it can mask natural um, communication pathways or if you're listening out for habitats or listening out for predators or trying to find food by listening then noise pollution creates that fog so it makes it more difficult for you to be able to use your acoustic world um, to survive. The more we've researched the impacts of noise pollution the more we've realized that it's more than just simply a masking problem. Um, we find that noise can cause stress in animals, including uh, most fish that we've studied. So we can measure a metabolic rate in fish or heart rate or the gill beat, the breathing rate, um, or look at how they perform in different scenarios. And we find that noise stresses fish. And that stress over longer periods of time changes their growth trajectory, their susceptibility to disease, ability to reproduce. Um, but we also find that noise sometimes because of that stress can tip the balance where they interact with other species. So, and that can go work in both ways. So we've done some studies where we've found that fish prey become more vulnerable because of the stress of the noise and possibly the distraction of the noise to their predators. But then we've also found that predatory fish sometimes lose out because they're, they're stressed by the noise. So it makes it very difficult to predict what the impact of noise pollution will be in the marine environment because there are so many species interactions in a food web or in an ecosystem. Um, but we do know that noise is destabilizing that, that world. It's interesting you say that because when, I mean, unless you scuba dive, I guess you won't know for sure, but when you're down under the water, if, the, if you're say on a boat, you can hear the boat from quite some way, you know, and even if once you get, um, not necessarily that close you can hear people talking on the boat you can make out what they're saying and the engine going and it is it is a noisy world definitely than than what you say down there 
Yeah. Um, what I'll I'll end on this last question, and you've already done some some incredibly beautiful interpretations of fish fish sound. So, what's the uh, your favourite fish sound? The the favourite noise that a fish has made so far? Uh, well, that is that is a brilliant question. I mean, I, for me, the biggest mystery at the moment is the pub laugh, laugh fish. That's a fish I'd really like to, to call my friend. It's got such a lovely, <laughs> deep, guttural laugh. It's clearly having a good time and, uh, and would be good on a night out. Um, the, the fish that we're studying in detail at the moment, which we, is the, the more we do it, the more, the more fascinating it becomes, is clownfish. Um, and that really started at, with Blue Planet 2, where we were working with the saddleback clownfish, the ones that you might remember had the problem of living away from the reef, no substrate for the females to lay her eggs onto. And so the male would go off and find different things, including the coconut shell, which she could then spawn onto. Um, we spent a lot of time watching those clownfish, trying to get good recordings for that first sequence. And by doing that, realized that they had quite complex vocal behavior. They've got a complex society anyway, in that you've got the dominant female, the next male who really would rather like to become the dominant female if she ever disappeared. Um, he's then um, looking after the colony, looking after the female. And then you've got all the juveniles that also would like to become adult at some point. We've now been doing quite a lot of work with multiple hydrophone arrays and video arrays to look at which fish is making which noise in different scenarios. And I've got a, a, an amazing uh, master student, Isla Healy, who now is pretty much transcribing clownfish conversations. <laughs> So she can watch a video and put subtitles to it because we know which fish is making the noise in different contexts and, and what the background is to the interaction that it's about to have or it's, it's just had. So I think we really are. I mean, she's kind of our Dr. Doolittle of a clownfish, <laughs> um, learning how to be able to communicate with these, with these amazing fish. There's, there's, you know, we're really scratching the surface. It's, it's wonderfully exciting, great fun, because it gives you a window into the lives of fish that we don't have otherwise. Um, and, and, you know, there is, there is still plenty that we can continue to explore. Uh, so being a photographer, I'm always preoccupied with the visual world when, I, when I'm in rivers, uh, kind of working close to home. But I have to admit that you've given me some thoughts, Steve. The next time I'm in the river, I might close my eyes just for a couple of minutes and just see what I can hear because I'd, I'm not normally concentrating on that, but it would be really interesting just to see if I can hear something that I don't recognize. So I found that utterly fascinating and you know, fish can talk to some degree. So that's great. So thanks for joining me on the podcast. Great, Jack. And I look forward to hearing what you hear. I think Steve's enthusiasm absolutely shines through in his voice when he's explaining all these different fish and the way that they talk and, and the mystery behind some of it, like some of the species he can't match up. We don't know which fish is making what noise. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. And I certainly am. Next time I'm in a river or a pond in the UK, uh, I'm going to kind of listen a little bit more because they, they must be making vocalisations. It's just not something that I'm normally listening out for. So can't wait to do that. Next week, I'm chatting to James Harding Morris, who works at the RSPB, but is also a representative of Back From The Brink, a conglomeration of different nature groups working to restore species that are teetering on the edge of extinction in Britain. So some fantastic work they're doing with a whole range of species. This has been the Bearded Tits podcast. I've been your host, Jack Perks, and I will catch you next time. Cheers.